Good evening to all of you watching tonight here. Um, December 2020, what a moment to talk about optimism, pessimism and statistics. I guess that in spite of everything else that has happened in this year already, 2020 will still go into history books as the COVID year. And since March, which already feels a pretty long time ago, all of us have seen our future through the lens of statistics, through the lens of numbers, infection rates, death rates, R values, effectiveness percentages of vaccines and so on. And staring at those charts and seeing the curves going up and down and up again, so have our hopes and fears gone up and down and up again, and it's still that same way today. Now, I'm not a virologist, uh, I'm a political economist, and this may well be more or less the last thing you will hear from me tonight about the coronavirus, and maybe that's for the better. You've been hearing enough about that already, I guess. But the virus serves a different purpose, as it were. It's an extreme example of how we see the world and how we hope for the world and fear for the world through the lens of statistics. Because those of us who haven't had direct contact with the virus yet are mainly seeing and perceiving it through the numbers that we see in charts, that we see in newspapers, that we see on social media. Now, you could say that in more general terms, we live in a relatively or actually pretty much statistical world in which we quantify so many things. Health, education, crime statistics, the economy, of course, but also things like the state of our democracy or the happiness of people. So I myself am an expert on economic statistics. So most of what I will tell you tonight has to do with economic statistics. But I think there are broader lessons to be drawn from the ins and outs of what we can and cannot and should and should not glean from statistics for the future. So when I say economic statistics, what I mean is what people would call headline indicators. So things like inflation rates, unemployment rates, GDP growth figures, trade figures, these things. So not the very detailed granular data, but the kinds of numbers that you would find in newspapers or in social media tweets or in the evening news. So these are the information snippets that circulate in our public conversation. And of course, if you dig very deep into the data, you will find nuance there. But the way that these headline indicators function is that they give us a general sense of where things stand and where they're going which is why tonight that's what we focus on. So when I talk about optimism, pessimism and statistics, there are two questions that I want to tackle. The first one is, should we or should we not take optimism from the figures, from statistics? Should they even serve as a potential source of optimism or pessimism? And secondly, should we be optimistic about what economic figures may be able to do for us in the future. Because of course, the amount of data that we have available, all the traces that we leave on the internet, but also the processing power that we have to harness that data has been growing exponentially. So does in the future, the data that we have allow us to have a better peek into what's ahead? Now my message, my main message tonight is that as a compass to navigate the present and to explore the future, statistics often function less well than they seem to promise and we would like. Sometimes the picture that they suggest is too rosy, at other times it's too gloomy, and yet at other times it's simply off. So my mission is for us to explore why it is that statistics frequently fail to live up to the promise that they seem to hold. And while I'll unfold the ins and outs of these issues over the coming 40 minutes, there's one thing that I can tell you already. The problem is not that statistics are simply wrong, that they're false. The problem also is not that the people who make these numbers somehow try to manipulate their audiences, whether us as citizens or policymakers or whoever else. Manipulation is not the problem. What is the problem, we'll see later. 
And then, as I said, the second question that we'll ask is, if there are limits to present day statistics, can we do better? Because as I said, in our age, we have more data, we have more computing power. And also there, I'm cautious. I'll argue in a minute that I wonder whether we have passed peak predictability, whether we're actually losing the grip on our future here. And I wonder whether no, much, no matter how much data we have about the here and now, it functions less and less well as a telescope to peer into the future. That doesn't mean that we should be optimistic or pessimistic about the future. What I think it does mean is that statistics will help us only so much to make up our mind where we're heading and to allow us to guide ourselves accordingly. There are also deeper lessons from that, but I'll return to that towards the end of this lecture. Now, optimism, pessimism, statistic. What are the link between these three things? You could say that we use macro social statistics about society, but also specifically macroeconomic statistics to do three things. To give us a sense of where we as a society stand in the here and now. To get an idea of what the future may hold. And to inspire our actions as we maybe try to change the future, improve things, make sure that maybe we have indeed less poverty on the world or less climate change or something like that. Let's talk about the first of these three first, statistics about the here and now. Now, the first things, of course, that we need to realize is that the things that we measure with macro social or macroeconomic statistics are themselves sort of quantitative fictions. They're not simply out there. They're abstract concepts. So if you take something like inflation or unemployment, these things don't sit out there somewhere and just wait to be measured, like you take a thermometer and just measure the temperature of something. But they're more or less useful simplifications that we impose on the world and on society to make sense of what's going on. So to make things simple, the unemployment rate ignores a whole host of things about labor markets and people job situations, right? It does not focus on things like job satisfaction, whether somebody works 15 or 50 hours per week, job security, whether people may actually be forced or coerced into it, doing a certain kind of work, how stable the job is. All these things do not happen. They don't have a place in the unemployment rate as it tries to give us a simple image of what's going on. The question then is, how useful is such a concept of unemployment to understand what's going on in our labor markets. That's where the bad news comes in, because I feel that, for example, unemployment as a concept, but also some of the others we'll talk about in a minute, map on less and less well on the world in which we live, and so give a less and less useful a picture of what's going on. Many of these headline economic indicators that we use and that I mentioned before, GDP, inflation rates, government debt later on, these sorts of things were very much made for a 1950s and 1960s world when they really blossomed, right? GDP was then about the production of material stuff, car tires, boxes of flour, pairs of shoes, this sort of stuff. Inflation was about changes in price levels of staples that people would consume, liters of milk, that sort of thing. And unemployment was specifically invented to get a handle on what was happening to mass employment of able-bodied males in factories, right? Unemployment was about the specific social problem of masses of men working in factories and being laid of an economic crisis and social, causing all sorts of social problems. Now, back in the days, that kind of a concept was relatively useful because it mapped on pretty well on the world in which people were living. Now, globalization, digitization, and social change have really pulled what these indicators try to measure and the world in which we live apart. Let's take a look at digitization first. Much of what is being produced in relatively rich countries are services. And services are much harder to measure and the growth in the volume of services is much harder to measure than is true, for example, for car tires or nails or sofa beds or something. 
Why? Because the volume of a service can simply be counted. We can count car tires, but imagine somebody who works in a salary administration, for example. And that person has a new computers or starts processing the salary slips of employees in a different way. Probably more salary administration is being produced there, but quantifying how much more of the service has been produced as people slowly see their jobs changing is extremely difficult. Much more simple when it comes to something like car tires. Also, many services are provided across borders, so it's really difficult to say to whose GDP they should be added. So if you have a Berlin branch of ABN AMRO connecting a customer in the United States and in Saudi Arabia who want to do a deal in Japanese yen, where is that service performed? To whose GDP should we add it? These things are really thorny when it comes to financial services and much simpler when it comes to actual material stuff. Then go a step further, think of digital products, right? So software, the, you know, the apps that you have on your smartphone, these sorts of things, right? Many of these products don't have an immediate price, right? Certainly many of the things that you have on your smartphone, chances are you didn't pay for them, right? So if that's the case, but people use all these services nevertheless, so something like Google Maps or something, right? There's a lot of consumption going on, people, consume stuff they didn't consume before, but it doesn't really show up in GDP statistics. Right? Or take a company like TikTok, and just for the sake of the argument, imagine that it was, say, created two years ago. Two years ago, somebody wrote the software that's TikTok. And imagine that in 2020, because lots of kids sit at home, it's downloaded across the globe one billion extra times. All the services, the entertainment services that are then produced in 2020 or consumed in 2020, when and where were they produced? Just copying that software and downloading it? That wasn't the main invention. TikTok was around already. So was it produced in 2020? All this extra service, was it produced in 2018? Because that's when the software was written. This may be actually produced in Flevoland, where the main data center is located, on which TikTok runs for the Netherlands. Or is it maybe actually produced by, say, my daughter who posts TikTok videos now and then, say, all the users who contribute content for free? Where does TikTok production take place and when did it take place? Really difficult to answer. So if you know an answer to this one, tell the statisticians because they're looking for one. Then globalization, right? More generally, the increasing cross-border flows of trade have made it very difficult to allocate where something is being made. And that's particularly true if we talk about products that have components that come from all over the world. If country, country A makes an apple and then sends that to country B, that's still relatively simple. But if I look around me at the webcam that I have here, the computer that stands or the microphone, many other things around me, they contain components that come from all over the globe. So where was this screen produced? It says it comes from China. But chances are that the actual display that's in there is from South Korea. Maybe the stand was made in Hungary. Where is this display from? Really difficult to allocate. Right? And even countries that are right next to each other, like the Netherlands and Germany, because of all these complicated trade mechanics, can disagree massively about what their bilateral trading relationship is. So when it comes to Dutch-German cross-border trade, on an annual basis during the past one to two decades, these two countries have disagreed to the tune of 20 to 30 billion euros about what the Dutch trade surplus was with Germany. Now then the, the third factor was social change. And that's particularly important when we think about how labor markets have changed. Compared to the 1950s world, one of the things that's really striking is, of course, that women have entered the labor force en masse. They were working before, for sure, mostly in the household, but they have entered paid employment. Of course, we also see many more self-employed people, right? We see things like zero-hour contracts. There has been a blossoming gig economy, as people have called it, which blurs the lines between working time and leisure time. We now have much more part-time work, and as I said, different ways of sharing different tasks, what that means is that standard notions of somebody is either employed or is unemployed 
don't really fit very well onto the very diverse and complex and checkered situations that we see out there in the labor market. A simple thermometer like unemployment will not give us a lot of useful information about what's going on there. The effect is something that you could call a growing measurement experience gap in the sense that there is a growing rift between what the official figures tell us and the individual experiences that many people have. So they will see numbers in the newspaper and somehow that doesn't really seem to rhyme with their individual experiences. And to my mind, that partially has something to do with the fact that these indicators were not made for the world in, we, in which we now live. Now, it's important again to emphasize that the problem is not that the statisticians are doing a poor job. Right? Statisticians appreciate and understand many of these problems. They've written about them a lot and they don't like them either. But it turns out that they're extremely hard to fix, a point to which we'll return to in a minute. So why do we have these outdated metrics? There's this beautiful image of people who have lost their pair of keys in the night going to search for them under the lamppost where the light is. Not because they think that that's where they lost them, but because that is where they can see something, right? And when it comes to measuring our society and economy, we face a similar problem. Because one reason that we focus on the economy is that that's where the light is, and that's where we can get numbers easily. If we want solid statistics, then naturally we focus on things that are relatively easy to count. Money is easy to count. The square meters of an office building, easy to count. Number of car tires, easy to count. Number of employment contracts, easy to count. Happiness, not easy to count. Job security, not easy to count. Value of Google Maps on my smartphone, not at all easy to count. What that means is we have an inbuilt tendency if we want to measure and solidly quantify these things in favor of things that are easy to count, and that means in favor of things that have price tags attached to them. So there's an inbuilt economism pulling us back to things that have money attached to them as we try to make sense of the economy and put it into spreadsheets. The second problem that we have is that we're still stuck in thinking of the economy in terms of national containers, if you will, national boxes. So the Dutch economy, the German economy, the Swiss economy, even though globalization means that these things intermesh more and more over time. What that means, for example, is that we have more or less meaningless averages, right? So many macroeconomic figures are averages. Inflation in the Netherlands, on average. Unemployment in the Netherlands. GDP per capita, on average, in the Netherlands, so on. Now, and that obscures if we have these average figures, and I think it obscures for middle class people like myself in particular, that many of the things that we fear, oh, that's where we could be heading, namely that wealth evaporates, environmental destruction, poor health, poor working conditions, and so on, already exist in our midst in certain strata of society that many of the people who consume these economic statistics may not be part of, may not be very aware of. So to say that on average, the Netherlands is doing pretty okay, quickly obscures the fact that there is a significant portion of the population that's not at all doing okay, right? Now, the thing is that as societies tend to polarize more and inequality rises and we see rifts widening and so like the solid middle class kind of like spreading out towards the end of society, this problem of these potentially meaningless averages increases over time. If everybody is clustered around the middle, it's not that much of a problem. If we see more dispersion over time, the problem becomes bigger. And the same is true with potentially meaningless aggregates. So Nienke, for example, earlier mentioned what happened to poverty around the globe, right? whether it has halved, stayed constant, or doubled. And if we talk about it in these aggregate terms, then of course there is a good news story to what Nienke just said. But it's also important to remember that a large chunk of that halving of global poverty has happened in a single country, in China. That's because it's so large, where the massive economic improvement has basically skewed the overall global image. It's going okay on the globe with poverty is largely attributable to a single country, China. And in many, many other places, things actually haven't changed at all. 
But if you tell a story about global figures, then it feels like uh, things everywhere are on the mend, which is not what's going on. Finally, then, there is, it seems, a growing disorder in what felt like a relatively ordered world. That may also be me in my age of like growing into, uh, you know, finding out that things are less orderly than maybe I would have liked them to be. But I think that many of the more or less imaginary boundaries that we used to have to order our world seem to be breaking down. So they were permeable already, but now it seems to sink in. So, for example, between already mentioned employment and unemployment. There are many more shades of gray these days where people are self-employed. Maybe they work as an Uber driver this morning, but not again this afternoon. And these things are slowly dissolving. But say, for example, also the boundary between production and the household. Extremely now in COVID times, and I'm a living example right here now, streaming to you from my bedroom, that separation line between workplace and work life and household life and household time has really blended into each other as people answer their emails at 10.30 at night on their sofa. Gender roles have started to blend into each other. Differences between my country and your country, you know, those boundaries have started to evaporate, but also between this imaginary boundary between highly developed countries and poorly developed countries. Where would a country like Saudi Arabia fit into something like this? In some ways, extremely rich. In other ways, we wouldn't say not terribly developed in other respects or say the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, but with arguably an extreme poverty problem on its hands that frequently doesn't look like a developed country at all. So do economic trends give us reason for optimism or pessimism? I think the question is optimism or pessimism for whom? For us on our little Dutch island in the global ocean? Is that what we're talking about when we say, are the numbers reason for optimism or pessimism? There are more people living in, great, in greater Lagos in Nigeria than there are in the whole of the Netherlands, right? Just to put things in perspective. Or we were talking about larger sections before. There are almost twice as many people in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa taken together than there are in greater Europe. Right. So even if you say, well, in Europe in general, things are going this way, that way or the other, take just these two other parts in which situations are often still relatively dismal, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia together, you have more than twice the population of what you have in all of Europe. So the question really is pessimism, optimism for whom? For us as people like myself, middle class Western country, yeah, that's one story. Just down the road here in Kreuzberg in Berlin, I have neighbors living in completely different positions and their fate is in mine and mine isn't theirs. Their optimism is in mine and neither is our pessimism. So what this means is perspective matters. Who is asking the question? For whom are we asking that question? Right. And part of what's happening is, of course, that now through debates that we have in society, we start to realize and appreciate that perspective matters. Right. And also within societies, the materialist trends so really production of stuff and cost of living and cost of things that we consume, right? These materialist values, are they still what matters to us? Well, for many people, the answer is yes. <laughs> they do still matter. They still care about, you know, whether other people like it or not. They care about, you know, stuff they consume, the size of their car, the size of their house, the price tag on their Canada goose jacket, right? For a growing part of the population, the answer by now maybe is no. Actually, that's not what it's about. Right? They espouse more post-materialist values, agged on by climate change, you know, questions about the purpose of life that COVID-19 may have raised, or maybe also a general disillusionment with a high-paced society and you know, where people turn to things like mindfulness or whatever to try to find a way out of this materialist bad race. Wherever you stand on this, what's important to realize is that whether you see economic trends as good or bad also depends a little bit on where you stand in this respect, where you find ourselves on this more eulogical or normative spectrum. Right? So it depends on your normative compass, whether the numbers that are out there should be a source for optimism or pessimism. Right? There are, let's say, two general possibilities where this is heading. Right? Could be that we 
will witness a general shift away from materialism so that you know there's a slowly general shift in society which are possible um, but then again many of these post-materialist lifestyles are of course also something that people must be able to afford right it's it's not cheap to be able to say ah you know i only drink hand plucked this and hand woven something else it's it's a luxury to be able to do that so what's also possible is that we will simply see increasingly different life worlds as you know, people, at least for the moment, continue to drift apart in different directions. But what that means is that there may be growing and deepening disagreement about how we should interpret different kinds of statistical trends, even if we take the figures at face value. In general, it is indeed more true that because numbers never speak for themselves, they always need a story to be put around them such that we can make sense of them. Numbers never say anything. They need a narrative to come with them. And of course, they also need somebody to tell that narrative, right? Those could be politicians, pundits, people who do a newscast, somebody like me, maybe here in the evening. And if you think back to what we've been witnessing in the United States these past, say, two or three months, but maybe also during the past four years, we come to realize how fragile this shared reality based on ostensible facts actually is. Something that used to feel pretty natural, that there are numbers out there and that's what the situation is in the United States, as you most certainly know, has been heavily disputed and there's no longer a consensus at all what the situation is. No matter the numbers still being produced to tell us something about COVID in the United States, unemployment in the United States, whatever else. Right, so what's now also on the line is not only is the number produced well or not, and what's the measurement problem, but the authority of the institutions that make these numbers actually, right? Because normally the numbers are most powerful when the number makers themselves remain invisible. When the number is just out there and somebody in the evening news just says, the number is five. And everybody goes, oh yeah, five. Whatever it is, inflation, unemployment, doesn't matter. But the moment they say, well, these people say it's five, but well, who knows, right? That's when things start to become fragile. There again, as an extreme example, we have the corona crisis, where both the numbers themselves about infection rates, death rates, R values, and all of these sorts of things, and also the institutions that produce these numbers have become really contested and politicized in the United States, but also in many other countries in Europe, in the Netherlands, in Germany and elsewhere. But one striking example of how numbers need a story is the rise of China. Right? The GDP figures of the past few decades clearly tell a story of a country that's really on the rise with really impressive annual GDP increases. And those of us lucky enough to have visited China will be able to have seen what that looks like when a country goes within a few decades from relatively poor to quite impressive economically. But to what degree is that actually a guide to the future? Because we've actually been there before. In the 1980s, there already was the fear that a rising East Asian giant would displace the United States as the leading world economic power. But that wasn't China, that was Japan. Japan had excellent growth rates in the 1980s. And more importantly, it had a story about why it was actually logical that Japan would be the country to displace the United States. It had better organization. People had better discipline. There was better coordination in its economy. There was more devotion to work. Right? The Japanese were poised to become, if you read 1980s business newspapers, the Americans of the 21st century. Except that they didn't. Because starting around 1990, that dynamism disappeared from the Japanese economy. And in the 30 years, 30 years since then, the Japanese governments have not been able to restart the engine of economic growth, however hard they tried. So there's a specific lesson here about statistics, right? It's because the Japanese growth rates, they didn't tell the whole story. Much of this Japanese America was actually built on debt that was accumulated. And when that came due, things ground to a halt. As I said, the government has tried all sorts of things to fix matters, but weirdly enough, 
Japan never quite got past that episode of boom and bust. Right, so the general lesson here is that the past may be a poor guide to tomorrow. Now, of course, that's always been true, right? So unexpected things happen now and then, that's no news. And in general, I still think that it's rational to assume that tomorrow will probably be sort of like today. That's a, you know, it's a reasonable guide to the future. But I think that the baseline expectation that tomorrow will be like today has lost some of its potency, right? So we may be entering a world that is less predictable than what we used to have, or the way that I framed it earlier. I wonder whether we have passed peak predictability. Now, the climate definitely is less stable than it used to be, for sure. Many ecosystems turn out to be less stable than they used to be, whether it's the Great Barrier Reef, but also many other regions in the world are changing quickly in a way that they didn't during the past decades or maybe centuries. But it's also true of economic and social dynamics, right? Think of the economy first. We really live in uncharted economic territory. Inflation, super low, close to zero. Interest rates, super low, close to zero. Growth rates, anemic, already before COVID, people have been talking about sort of like the end of growth in different ways. Real incomes for large segments of the population more or less stagnant. The only economic variable that has really been going up has been inequality. Now, for that kind of a situation, standard economic theory that was about the decades after the Second World War with healthy growth rates and reasonable interest in inflation rates offers no really useful guide, right? And if we peek ahead further into the future, what will automation and the widespread application of artificial intelligence actually mean for labor markets? Politics has also become more unstable, right? Polarization, up. Inequality, up. We mentioned that already. Common information, backdrop, everybody watching the same evening news, down. Effect on democracy, very unclear. Right? We've just been witnessing, or maybe actually still witness, what's happening in the United States as a potential harbinger of what these things can do. Finally, in terms of global politics, say where is, for example, the relationship between China and the USA headed, or where are these countries headed? Is Trumpism an outlier or the new normal? I think it's too early to tell. We really don't know. China seems much more stable, but some people see it as an internally mildly authoritarian government, but that's ultimately benign. Other people fear that here is a country that's secretly spreading its tentacles around the world to become a new dominant power and an oppressive one too. Which one is it? How will it affect us? We really don't know. What this means is that there used to be a world order in terms of how societies were ordered, but also, you know, both internally, but also between each other. And this order world meant that, you know, the global politics, democratic politics, economic systems, and politics were somewhat occasionally understood. And within that order, many of the metrics that we had developed to measure it were a relatively useful guide. But I feel that this order has started to disintegrate and is disintegrating further. And so the metrics to capture it have lost some of their potency as guides for what is ahead of us. Right, and that's where the statistics come in. So in spite of the measurement problems, at least conceptually, economic growth used to be a good predictor for a country where a country was heading because growth also equaled job creation. Right. So and if that's the case, then focusing on growth makes sense. But nowadays things are not that easy anymore. Right. So if growth is about how much is produced from one year to the next, then it starts to become tricky if all that additional product is actually coming from machines. Right. So higher productivity efficiency, if there's more and more robots, more and more artificial intelligence producing this extra stuff, because then the effect on employment all of a sudden is nil. And the only thing that rises in equality is because the robots are making relatively more stuff. It also means that the people who own the robots get relatively more money. 
Now, how should we interpret these kinds of things, these kinds of trends? Well, some would say that we need to redouble our efforts to grow so that we stay ahead of the machines, as it were. Others would argue that we actually need to go in the opposite direction because that race has been lost already and think in much more fundamental ways about how we redistribute work and wealth in our societies to prepare ourselves for a stable future. Right? But there's a different story as well. Growth is also supposed to measure how much what we consume changes from one year to the next. And there, as I said earlier, right, within a decade, smartphones have completely changed our lives and our consumption patterns as well. Right? Many of the things we consume in terms of social content, but also navigation systems, music that we listen to, podcasts, blogs, what have you, know, a universe has opened up of consumption of all sorts of intangible goods that wasn't there before, but that you hardly see reflected in GDP numbers. So yet other people would say that this low economic growth is actually just a chimera because there is a lot of increase in consumption. It's just not reflected in the figures. Now let's get to the final question. If the economism that's sort of built into the metrics that we have is the problem, how optimistic should we be that we can bend the numbers that we use to describe society to our will and make them good guides to the future. So you could ask, could we align these kinds of statistics with post-materialist values? As I said, there is an inbuilt tendency in these statistics for easy to quantify metrics because metrics that are meaningful but contestable often don't survive political conflict. So for example, when we talk about government debt, one of the problems is that a big chunk of the money that governments owes in the future is pension promises that governments have made. But because these are extremely difficult to translate into here and now debt figures, we tend to ignore them. Right? So pension promises of governments are not included in headline debt figures, not because they don't matter, but because they're hard to capture in a reliable way. Right? Or take something like happiness, which we all care about a lot. Again, that's very difficult to capture and becomes quickly politicized. If we, for example, do a survey at somebody's door, it wouldn't be very difficult to twist the questions that we ask the people living in a house in a way that they come out looking relatively happy on our survey sheet of paper or actually not so happy. And when these figures then get put together and become the subject of political debate, what quickly happens is that the party in the ideological conflict that doesn't like the results of the survey will just point to it and say that the measurement approach was completely wrong and off. So before you know it, we're no longer talking about the results of the survey, whether we like those or not, but whether the measurement approach was actually the right one or not. That makes these kinds of figures very hard to really anchor in politics. Now, as I said, we ask, can we take optimism or pessimism from the numbers? And should we be optimistic about the potential of numbers to guide us forward? Right? I think I can summarize, summarize my points by saying that there are a range of trends that make things really difficult for us. Economies and societies have become more complex. Production and consumption goes beyond the material things that used to dominate our economies. Patterns of order that used to dominate in the second half of the 20th century have started to fray and continue to disintegrate, meaning that current trends are not necessarily instructive for what happens in the future. There are competing interpretations of what the numbers actually mean, and that competition between the interpretations has grown. So there is growing uncertainty about where we should take all this. There is realization that, say, a Dutch middle class perspective on what are the numbers telling us? It's no longer the natural, obvious one that should be reported in the evening news. And there are stark differences in outlook on the world in general and what we should want from the world. So polarization. What that means is that we need to walk a tight rope on the one hand between fair criticism of the numbers, where we say, I'm not sure whether they're saying what you think they're saying. But on the other hand, we see the other extreme example in the United States, also respect for the people who work hard to put these numbers out there in the first place. And the realization that 
trust in these numbers is hard to build, but easy to destroy. There has to be room for criticism, but it also needs to be respectful and in the realization that even though it's not always the case, sometimes, sometimes numbers are, of course, better than nothing as we try to find our way forward. Right, so my message here is not that statistics are not to be trusted or that there's manipulation out there, but there are inherent limits to them and the limits may be getting bigger and that we shouldn't overload statistics by expecting too much from them, setting us up for failure. This situation, and that's the final thing I want to share with you, always reminds me of, for me, one of the most memorable scenes of uh, Star Wars, A New Hope. So that's part four uh, or part one, depending on officially it's part four, the first Star Wars movie that ever came out. And there is a scene at the end where the hero Luke Skywalker sits in a fighter jet and he needs to fly into this huge thing, the Death Star, and he needs to get just the right angle to shoot at the core of the thing to make it blow up. And he's being chased by all the enemy forces and he has a visor in his helmet that projects all sorts of numbers and little graphs and he tries to steer his little fighter jet looking at all these numbers trying to weasel his way through these fighters field and it doesn't go very well he finds himself chased and chased more and at some point he decides that to be successful in what he needs to do the only thing that's really left is just to lift this visor up stop staring at all those numbers and little graphs, and in his case, rely on the force, as it's called. Now, of course, I'm not trying to suggest that policymakers should just rely on the force when they make their decisions, or citizens for that matter. That's, of course, not my point. In fact, if you equate the force with more mundane gut feeling, then I think there's already too much gut feeling out there in society rather than too little of that. But what it does mean, and that's why it remains instructive, is that there does come a moment where statistics can actually stand in the way of a clear view of the situation or path ahead of us. And I think that in those moments, and I think in the 21st century we face some of these, we need the courage and the self-confidence and the trust to take the necessary decisions without relying on statistics as the ultimate compass to the future. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Daniel, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for your story. Um, I found it really interesting and to me it also shows that the world as we look at it is a lot more complex than you might think. And I think your story is a very uh, important story to tell. Yeah. Um, I hope people at home also have questions. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll um, get them to Daniel. Um, I have a question myself as well. Um, is your story being heard? I think you tell a very important story. Do you have the feeling that, uh, like I know you, you've written a piece on the correspondent, you've talked about this at Brainwash. Do you feel like your story is also being heard, for example, by uh, politicians? I think part of what's going on is that the statisticians, so the people who make these numbers, they already understand many of these problems very well. And many you know, of the things that I've learned about statistics, actually, I've learned from them, you know, going to the Central Bureau for Statistics in the Netherlands, but also the OECD or the IMF, or where is it also, and I learned from them. When it comes to politicians, I think their things are potentially a bit more difficult. Um, and one of the difficulties is the following, that an answer that you could give to the problems that I've outlined is that you shouldn't try to focus on just a single number, unemployment, but that you have a whole dashboard that does actually try to capture all the things that I've been talking about. So, you know, what's happening with underemployment, what's happening to job security, what's happening to this, that and the other. And when a politician comes and says, OK, what's my labor market situation today? You don't say, it's gone from 5% to 4.5% or something, but you say, here, here's a 10-page set of Excel sheets. Uh, and if you look through those, you get a nuanced and holistic picture of what's going on. The politician is going to come back to you and say, no, I need the number. Are things better or worse? The statistician says, well, but you, you don't want that, right? You want the nuanced picture. And they go like, no, I can't sell that. And so if statistics are simplification machines, then 
often politicians find themselves in a situation where in communicating with the wider public, they need such simplification that it's really at odds with the kinds of nuance that we would also like to see. So I think they realize and understand the problem in their daily work that's much more hard to integrate. Yeah. And um, do you think the problem lies at the, at the uh, politicians? So they don't want to share this more nuanced image because it's, uh, I don't know, too hard to make uh, policy or they um, like or they don't get voters if it's they if they say it's all complex and I actually don't know and there are many aspects or um, they just cannot work with happiness rates because it's too complex to make a um, yeah to make a new law or to make uh, policy. So I think there are three things going on. The first one is that as a politician you obviously have uh, story and a political narrative that you want to sell and as all of us politicians are absolutely not unique in that you know we'll use those numbers that suit the story that we want to tell and we'll ignore those numbers that don't fit our own narrative right so people are always selective in the kinds of evidence that they present and that's only to be expected i think we do that ourselves as well the second thing is that indeed i think politicians often find that their audiences want or you know, so get a kick out of simple messages, right? I think many politicians who've tried to come with really nuanced stories never got very far when they were facing off against somebody who did really, you know, say, no, it's gone down and that's all that you, my voter, need to know about it. Um, what I think is also true, however, and that's the third point that comes in play here, is that if as a politician, you say, well, the thing that we should really focus on is something like aggregate happiness of the Dutch population or something, right? Conceivable that you have something like that. You may well find that the metric you're focusing on is actually extremely hard to manipulate. You don't have a button that you can push if happiness is too low or say, oh, happiness is too low, so let's go increase it. And then three years later, it's three percentage points higher. There are other variables in policy where you can turn the knob. You can say, OK, we'll hire 50,000 new teachers. We'll lower the interest rate. We'll borrow more money. We'll do this, we do that. There are buttons that you can turn where you can try to influence something that seems important. But some of these really big questions are not so easy to influence. And so politicians could very quickly become hostage to metrics about things that are important to our lives, but extremely hard to influence for them and I could understand it if they felt a little bit reluctant to be evaluated on the basis of what has happened to happiness in the country, where actually there may not be so much they can do about that within four years. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I, I understand it's also hard to make policy for something really complex and broad, and um, that's clear. There's a question in the chat from Jeffrey, and uh, he asked, what do you think there's a way to grade the quality of data sets? So that decisions can be made with the quality of the data of the numbers in mind. Um, so in principle, I think you know this is a glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. So I, I definitely think that there is better and worse data. Um, and by the way, I think that the Central Bureau of Statistics in the Netherlands actually is, and I've talked to talked to many statisticians around the world, is one of the world leaders when it comes to being really good at gathering data and processing it. So I think the Netherlands actually stands as an example that, that is really leading the way in many ways here. So yes, I think that's possible. Um, many of the very basic things that you can and should do to prevent bad data, for example, when you do surveys with people or something, I think are well understood by the statisticians. Um, so def there definitely is worse data. I think there tends to be an upper limit, as it were. So like the curve you can get, you know, it's, at the beginning, it's very easy to improve the quality of your data by eliminating more or less obvious defects. But then as time goes on, you seem to hit a sort of barrier where you would like to keep going up further, but, you know, there are inherent limits to that. So um, I think there's definitely worse data than what we have. Um, whether there are buttons that we can push to make it so much better, that's where I'm more skeptical. And, and would it be possible to say, um, to sort of label data sets? Did you say if you haven't taken in account several aspects, just to say something, for example, then your data isn't really reliable, so we shouldn't use it, or that's not really... Well, so, so, so I, 
I think the general thing to do is basically to say that people, everybody, right? I as a scientist, a journalist, whoever, that they should know their data. There is, if you will, a due diligence aspect there. And in particular, you know, it's, it's always impossible to know all the ins and outs of the data that we process. You know, for that, there's just too much information coming at us. If you're a data specialist, then maybe yes. For most others, you know, that's not really practically feasible. So I think what is important is that there are certain seals of approval. As I said, if something comes from the Dutch Central Bureau of Statistics, I tend to have relative faith that like many of the things that can be done have been done. Um, but also that we keep an eye open and train our mind on what the most common problems are with certain kinds of data, right? So people who are experts about say crime statistics, you know, they have identified a number of things where they say, oh, you know, I'm not an expert on crime statistics, but they'll say, you know, here are the five things that frequently go wrong when people use and think about and look at crime statistics, right? And so if somebody works for a newspaper, you would wish, and maybe that's the case already, that these people who then use these crime statistics in their newspaper article would also have these five things at the back of their mind. They can't know every detail of these statistics, but you know, the point is to get numbers smarter. And then for us, obviously in a way that's selective, focused on the kinds of numbers that we deal with and that we can avoid the biggest interpretation mistakes that people normally make. And I think that already takes us a real step further. Yeah. It's interesting what you say to train our minds because that also really links, I think, to what you've said before, like whether we really want or are able to train our minds. As you said, that people are more and more um, polar, um, yeah, polarized or following different um, media. And Seiko in the chat is asking, um, what about the people so deep in their bubble? Do they refuse to see the numbers um, as they are? Good question. <laughs> I've sometimes uh, wondered about that, um, right? And that's one of the things that I was thinking about when I say that, you know, I think there is room for asking critical questions. I think that's, you know, how we often get ahead also. But at the same time, you know, that needs to be balanced against a willingness to appreciate the authority of the people who put these together. So when you ask specifically what's going on with some people, maybe take more extreme or you know, extreme, extremely skeptical views. As I said, I wonder too, I don't know exactly the answer. That would be probably more something for psychologists, but I have the general impression that people seem to, and I'm slightly speculating, you will admit that, but this is the hobby psychologist and the hobby statistics psychologist that comes to the fore that people in general don't like to hear messages that would somehow put a big question mark to their relatively comfortable position in society. So right, I think in the Netherlands, we've seen a number of these debates where privileges of men, privileges of white people, privileges maybe also of relatively wealthy people and other sorts of privileges, you know, got a question mark put next to them whether things should really be that way and then people would bring statistics and say okay and here is you know what the gender pay gap is or what something else is or here's evidence of discrimination in the labor market or all sorts of things or say for example that you know people who consume a lot and produce a lot of carbon dioxide by their lifestyles they need to be the ones who really need to change their lifestyles because otherwise they're wrecking the planet when it comes to these kinds of numbers, I feel there is a significant share of the population that because it would have such implications for their privileged positions and how that needs to change, that they're extremely reluctant and extremely strongly pushed back against the evidence that would have such deep implications for their lives. So I think that's part of what's going on. I mean, but again, take that, feel free to take that with a grain of salt. That's the hobby <laughs> side, just me speaking, not the political economist. Well, well, I think it's quite good uh, hobby uh, psychologizing. I think psychological <laughs> research actually has, has shown has shown this, or there has been uh, research on this. I'm also curious to hear from you as a as a researcher how you've experienced the past um, times, because if you as you said, there has been a lot of uh, criticism on numbers as well, a lot of um, news that people don't believe the uh, REVM, for example, or the government statistics. 
How do you feel as a scientist criticizing the way we look at numbers? Have you felt like you've been uh, needed to be extra careful explaining what you think or careful but um, with being critical looking at numbers? Well, so one thing that's definitely happened is that this political climate in which I've been studying these kinds of things has changed. I started with this in 2014. So that was a time when, and I was in the United States back then, that was at a time when Barack Obama was still president of the United States. And it still felt that we lived in a relative consensus kind of world, you know, so when I talked about the more the intellectual and cognitive order, at least to the people who were relative insiders or relatively well off in society, for like for them, that world was still standing, right? There was Donald Trump was still very far in the distance. Brexit was at that time still far in the distance. All these other things. No, it seemed like things were progressing on a straight, steady path. At that time, I felt to be somebody who says, well, you know, maybe some of these things that the numbers tell us that that was a pretty rebellious thing to be saying. I didn't expect, you know, that many people would agree with me there, but, you know, I was the one kicking against the shins of pretty strongly established institutions there. And then two years later, you know, we got the vote in favor of Brexit, we got Donald Trump, and we got a whole host of other things that happened since then. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the company of rather, I would say, suspect people, right? Because now, Donald Trump might be the first one to applaud me and say, yeah, Daniel also says that these statistics, they're crap all over the place. We shouldn't believe them. Exactly what he's been saying too, right? I don't think he'll retweet what's happening here tonight, but who knows? Um, so I was all of a sudden in the company of slightly suspect political occurrence there. And yes, so since then I have tried to become more careful, which is also why I underlined during my lecture that this is not about manipulation. This is not about ignorant statisticians who don't do their work very well, right? They know these problems, they want to do better, but it's more what numbers can do when at the same time, you know, we want them to give a faithful representation of reality out there that is fair to everybody else. At the same time, that's simple enough to be put in a one page memo or a tweet and that evolves with societies and the globe as it changes. Asking these four things at the same time of numbers is asking very much. And that's where part of the limit lies, not in individual people trying to mess with us. It's actually so strange to think of how much has changed since 2014 and how yeah. this whole political discourse as well is so different than it was um, back then. Do you, um, you've been studying this for, for six years now. Um, for you, what was the biggest um, yeah, or the main thing you found maybe which you didn't expect or the main, um, yeah, is there something that really um, to you is the most, uh, yeah, surprising thing you found? Um, I don't know whether there is one individual thing that's most surprising. Um, what I've realized more and more over time is that the question is not only what do we measure and how do we measure it, but it's connected and blends into it. How does a society deal with these figures? What happens to them after they're being produced? Right. So the question is not just um, is GDP a good indicator to tell us how we're doing economically, but it's also if it is a poor indicator, how come there is still such high demand for GDP? Why are we still so beholden to this number? Why is it still so prominent in political discourse? And that is not a question that's only about is the measurement yardstick, is the economic thermometer the right one, but how do public debates function? How do institutions function? What kind of a number do people find credible and which ones do they not find credible? And that's an aspect of studying the politics of statistics that I hadn't quite had on my radar screen when I started out with this. And have you got the chance to uh, to go into that the past years? Have you been able to address that as well? Or is it something you might want to do in the future? 
I think we've written so together with the other people who are part of the team with which I've been working. I think we were on and off maybe like eight or nine people who have a different time periods uh, worked with me in the Fickle Formulas team at the University of Amsterdam. And it's definitely something that I've spent some time on. And, you know, some of these dynamics I mentioned earlier. So right, that has to do with the fact, for example, that there is a demand for simplicity, uh, that there are also always tendencies if we give policymakers, for example, a broad dashboard of figures, all of which tell part of the story about, say, government debt or something, there's this tendency to always cherry pick the ones that suit your political story, an inherent problem. The economism I mentioned that GDP is so attractive because all the different things that are being produced in an economy already come with a price tag attached to it. And so it's very easy to kind of like squeeze it all together. In that sense, it's completely different than something say like the sustainable development goals where everybody says, oh, they're so important. And you know, they, like they cover from biodiversity to gender equality and quality of governance and democracy, everything's in there. True, it is in a way, but there, of course, it's so much more difficult. I actually think it's impossible to somehow condense, you know, this unwieldy collection of 300 plus indicators into uh, easy to convey story about how the Netherlands or Switzerland or Uganda is doing. Impossible, right? And that is a unique advantage that something like GDP has and that people will therefore keep picking up that something that we think is much more important, you know, the complexity and the sustainable development goals simply lacks. And so it's in the communication of these things that so much happens, not in, you know, whether there are smart scientists or statisticians who try to measure the right things. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, someone at the uh, at the moment also said that in the chat, Siko, he said that um, that it's also hard to change old habits and that the GDP suited our narrative for a very long time. And now we see we need new narratives, but it's hard, yeah, to hard to make those. Well, and you know, there is no shortage of attempts that people have made to come up with alternative indicators. There are actually quite a few of those, right? And but it's been really strikingly difficult to make them stick anywhere. You know, the United Nations itself has developed a whole compendium that's called the System of Environmental Economic Accounts. Gigantic research project. It was supposed to be sort of like the GDP 2.0, which includes all these other things, ecosystem values and what have you. you know, gigantic intellectual effort. Nobody's ever heard of that thing, right? It was felt like it was almost dead in the water. It kind of like, you know, crumbled under all the intellectual weight and work that were on the shoulders of this thing that was now finally trying to do everything right that GDP did wrong, right? And that's, and as I said, you know, that's a point where I think we can overload statistics when we expect them to do all these things at the same time. Simplify, do justice to complexity, do justice to different people, change with the times. Uh, I think that's extremely hard. So the problem with that new intellectual idea was that it was too hard. There were too many aspects involved and it was actually too realistic or too. Yeah. Too well, well, so say, for example, what people will then try to do that they say, OK. Key problem of GDP is that it doesn't take into account environmental destruction. You know, we can emit pollutants into the air for free. We, you know, normally we don't have to pay for that. They you know, try with emission tradings and emission certificates, but in principle it's for free you know, to pour something into a river or something. And so what you would want to do is somehow have the wealth of the planet in a way where you could quantify the implicit cost of doing damage to an ecosystem because, I don't know, you know, biodiversity is going down, certain kinds of frogs are disappearing from the Amazon rainforest. But what's the model that puts a useful price tag on a particular species of frog disappearing from the rainforest in Guatemala. Right? Somehow you would want that to be part of the picture because people would say that's terrible that these frogs are disappearing. And I think it's really sad, but quantifying that and putting that in the same equation where you also have something to say about, you know, 
what happens to the production of car tires and the investment that you make in human capital, as it's called, so educating people, building their minds as future productive resources. You know, before you know, this thing becomes so unwieldy that it's not impossible to somehow bring it all together in one kind of formula. But that's often been the ambition because people felt that something that was ultimately as elegant and simple as GDP was necessary to replace it. And that doesn't seem to be forthcoming anytime soon. And if it were to do so, there will always be scope for people to say, so you think that frog in Guatemala is really important, so you put a high price tag on it. I think we have that genetic material somewhere in a freezer in our lab, let the frog die, genetic material saved, no problem, no real loss for humanity other than frog lovers. Right? It, that becomes really difficult where to draw that line. So I think that's the kind of weight that makes it really hard to make these metrics stick. Yeah, so reality is, is way too hard to put into numbers. And actually, maybe there also lies a risk if we put a price tag to frogs. Uh, we can <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, maybe then people can also say, well, we don't, it's, it's fine. We, we take away the frogs and that suddenly only it's becomes... Fine about money and about um, yeah cost uh, equation. That's right, yes. Um, I'm curious actually what you're going to do next because your pro your project uh, finished or it is, is going into 2020. I read something about artificial intelligence, but I'm curious to hear a little bit more about it and I guess people online uh, would also like to know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. It's something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, so I've been studying these statistics for six years and I felt that I started to reach a point where most of the things that I could add to our conversations about statistics and how they function politically, I had said already. So I reached a little bit of a saturation point as it were. And I wondered from that point where I felt that I as a social scientist could really make a contribution to societal debates. And that also meant for me that I was thinking, but also felt in my heart that I needed a, a topic that was really worth my time and really important. And two came to mind. Uh, the first one was climate change, which seems like a huge challenge in the 21st century. Now, enough people do that already, and it's technically too complex for me. And the other one was policies about artificial intelligence, because I think there is a huge wave of societal and economic transformation about to break over our heads. It's starting already in ways that we don't really see because it's always in the software, right? You can, you can still see a robot in a factory. You don't see artificial intelligence. It's just what starts to pop up in your Spotify playlist suggestions or wherever else, right? That's it's invisible. So, so we, it doesn't feel like it's everywhere already, but it's already in many places. It will have huge ramifications. And what interests me as a political scientist, political economist is, how we in Europe, in the Netherlands, in Germany, but also at the European level, will make choices, political choices, as we move into the artificial intelligence future. Who is going to decide which kind of artificial intelligence can be developed, how it can be deployed, how much say do individuals need to have about how, when, and where it can be developed and deployed. How are we going to deal with the massive competition coming from the United States and China? Will we keep their products out of Europe because we feel that they're using artificial intelligence in a way that we're uncomfortable with? There are big questions there for Europe to tackle, and I want to understand better who makes these choices right now and how so. That's interesting. It's, it's interesting to hear how you um, are sort of doing the same thing. Whereas in the beginning you, or in your last project, you looked at the hidden side and the choices um, surrounding uh, economic uh, data, and you're going to do the same um, with artificial intelligence, a little bit about oh, the, the sites we don't see or the decisions that are being made that maybe we don't uh, think about. Yeah, 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 there's definitely a parallel there, yes. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, we finish up here. I've, I've learned a lot. I think the people um, who are watching have also learned a lot. Normally, this would be the moment we would do a small applause. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can do that all by myself, but that's a little bit sad. Maybe if people who are watching, if you like, put something, uh, put a small response in the 
chat if you um, like to talk. Daniel, thank you a lot. I found it very interesting and I think it was also a very good ending of this series of four. Um, to everybody, all our lectures can be watched on YouTube and also on our website, uh, sg or sg.uu.nl. And in this series, we've also talked with a psychologist on how you can train optimism or optimistic worldview. We've talked with a historian about optimism and pessimism uh, in history and how they've always gone hand in hand. And we've talked with a philosopher who argued that the world is morally improving and actually getting better and better. So if you look, uh, if you like to have a look at those lectures as well, um, feel free. You can also follow us on uh, YouTube and then you can also uh, watch uh, the videos uh, on our channel. For now, um, everybody, thanks a lot and um, see you next time.